Hello and welcome to another edition of the Bridging Chicago podcast. My name is Joe Amari and I'm an associate attorney at SATC Law. Uh, you can find our podcast at bridgingchicago.com and also find it at the SATC Solutions Center website. And I'm grateful to be joined today by Dan Burgles, uh, director and founder of Miami Street Medicine. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Dan, you are originally from Chicago, correct? That's right. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you ended up in Miami. So this is uh, where I got into medical school. Uh, it's also where my family moved. Uh, my sister kind of came here from undergrad, and I guess she just brought the whole Burkholz family down here. <laughs> <laughs> One at a time, right? Yeah. So you're originally from Chicago. Uh, where did you go to high school? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Hinsdale, uh, Burr Ridge, kind of like right on County Line Road. Okay. Southwest suburbs. Exactly. Do you miss the winters at all? You know, I actually do. Um, <laughs> I know you guys probably hate to hear that, but seasons are really nice. Yeah. Uh, it's 10 degrees outside. So right now I'm not sure <laughs> I agree, but maybe, <laughs> maybe in the spring or in the fall. Um, yeah. So you are the founder of a group, Miami Street Medicine, is part of the Dade County Street Response Team. Um, this group for our listeners is providing very important medical care to those who are afflicted with homelessness in Miami. Danny, could you tell us a little bit about how this group came to be and what your thought process was leading into it, into its creation? Yeah, Absolutely. So street medicine is kind of a new and emerging field in medicine. Um, but at the same time, it's as old as medicine itself. So medicine started with house calls. You know, you go right to where people are and check up on them with your bag of supplies. Uh, it's how physicians started off. And, you know, recently uh, in kind of the 80s, this doctor, Dr. Jim Withers, Dr. Jim O'Connell, um, some of these folks really pioneered the modern day field of street medicine. And this is just like making house calls, but to people without houses. So that's what we do. We follow this model of street medicine um, and we try and be as creative and flexible with our services to meet people exactly where they're at. Um, both physically and metaphorically. Uh, we go out with backpacks uh, filled with medical supplies, case managers, and just empathy and humanity as well. Uh, it can't be overstated how important it is to just sit down with someone uh, and be a person first. And then we take our, our medical skills, our medical knowledge and supplies, our case management team, uh, we, we sit with folks and we hear their stories and try and use the resources and knowledge we have to get them connected to broader community services, uh, get them document ready for housing, get them primary care follow-ups. And for folks who maybe aren't ready for those steps, we provide whatever treatment that we can right there on the street. And you said this started in the 80s, correct? This movement towards street medicine. Uh, yeah, I believe I believe it was the 80s. Is that is that starting to become uh, commonplace to see in cities across America? Is this something that's pretty unique to Miami? No, the the street medicine movement has definitely grown and grown and grown since its inception. Uh, more recently, the Street Medicine Institute was formed, which is sort of a guiding organization uh, by Dr. Jim Withers, who kind of helps oversee like a student coalition and a yearly conference. Uh, and we're now seeing upwards of, I think, 40 student run street medicine programs in the country, uh, a number of others that are more professional out of FQHCs and ma major hospital systems, uh, such as Bo Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, we're seeing these programs pop up all over because not only is this an astoundingly simple and good idea to go bring services to the people, but we're also finding that it's really financially viable too. 
that if you can go out and meet people where they're at and provide care where they're at, you might catch that infection, infection of the toe before it becomes an amputated foot. And this is actually saving hospitals and taxpayers millions of dollars a year uh, by doing this outreach and getting folks off the street uh, into stable housing or into primary care relationships. Sure. And is there an impediment for these people seeking treatment earlier? Like you, you mentioned that, you know, that you're trying to catch this stuff early. What what would you say, you know? systemically is causing these individuals to avoid going and getting treatment when that infection starts rather than when it becomes a much more serious medical issue? There's, that's a great question. Um, there's a variety of reasons and certainly everyone has their own. Uh, one of the first people I met was what some might call service resistant. Um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't go to a hospital, wouldn't go to a clinic. Hmm. Um, but we found out after spending some time with this woman uh, that she had survived some very serious trauma and no longer felt comfortable being indoors. Um, and, you know, that's, that's just one example, but we've certainly met people who, let's say, have had long bouts of solitary confinement in prison and don't feel comfortable getting treatment in these traditional settings. Um, other people have been mistreated by the medical system, uh, medical providers. We have a lot of trust to rebuild, a lot of trust to gain, but mostly the problems are more systemic. Uh, you know, these are all individual kind of cases I'm, I'm talking about, but uh, basic lack of access is really the number one reason. There are a lot of people who want these services that just can't access them. There aren't adult primary care appointments of, available um, or, maybe they're not familiar enough with the paperwork in the process to get themselves registered and uh, an appointment there. Sure. And I mean, I think we're all familiar with like the administrative process that goes into seeing a doctor. I mean, even if you can go into a doctor regularly, oftentimes you're filling out, updating paperwork, but if you don't have any knowledge of what goes into that, it's probably intimidating to say the least. Would you say that a lack of access to information too plays a role in, you know, the prolonged wait to go seek treatment? For sure it does. Um, you know, it's, it's no accident that, and we study these things, we have an EMR, it tracks um, demographic data on our patients. Over half of our patients haven't seen a primary care physician in five years haven't seen a physician five, five years. years. Wow. So, you know, that's, that's half of our patients. A number of them, it's been greater than 10 years, 20 years, some of them even once a year, um, but they have very complex and chronic problems and that's not nearly sufficient. So, uh, you know, we definitely know that people are being underserved, that our community is underserved, not to mention the average lifespan is 35 years about shorter. Um, for even people who are in the same socioeconomic status, but one of them is unhoused. Uh, their lifespan is, is shorter on average by 35 years. So there, there's definitely a lack of access here. Um, now, the information you asked about, for sure, we found great success with our patient navigation program. We have students who are familiar with the community resources, who are familiar with insurance, the hospital systems, and they sort of hold a patient's hand and, and walk with them through the appointments. We sit with people in the emergency room and make sure that they're admitted and treated fairly and properly by the system, um, that they're not just kicked back out onto the street. We ensure that people get the information they need to sort of advocate for themselves um, because it, it can be very much shrouded in confusion and um, and misinformation, what to do and how to get health care. Sure. I, circling back, I, something I think you thought you said that I thought was interesting is, is the student involvement in this. Um, I think, and I imagine this is not the case in all medical programs, but in having this experience as a medical student, do you think this is going to shape your uh, relationships with your future patients and kind of how you understand medicine and the needs that your field has going forward? 
most definitely. Uh, this, this has been eye-opening for me, some of the unique needs and circumstances of our patients. Um, we really have to meet people where they're at. And I think me medicine has to uh, be flexible for folks who can't access it in the traditional setting, in the traditional ways. Because what other choice do we have? Leaving those folks out, that's just not an option. So we have to be fl flexible and we have to try and meet people's needs. Um, and I, I would say that's one of the biggest things that I've learned. Uh, and one of the others is that it's not always the role of the physician to fix the problem, right? What like, do you mean by uh, that? A lot. So the word patient actually means in Latin, one who suffers. And I think it's a great word, right? Patient, one who suffers. Um, but the goal of the physician isn't necessarily to cure the patient or fix their problem. Uh, we can't always do that. Oftentimes we can't. But what we can always do is we can always be there for the patient. We can always be there for that person who is struggling. And that is our primary role. Um, so I've seen that a lot out on the street where folks have very serious conditions and there's nothing that we can do in our limited capacity to make any any meaningful impact at at the very most maybe we can put a silver lining on a problem but we can't strike at the root of it and on one hand it it feels like you know you know we're going to be doctors we have doctors here they should be able to fix this problem but i've i've really learned through this work that our primary job is to just be there for the person and then do what we can after. Sure. Can you, uh, so I'm having a bit of a hard time. When you say, the, is it because of a lack of facility because you're out on the street? Is it because that it's too far gone in the uh, development of the condition or disease that it's, it's no longer treatable in the way it could have been? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, um, that's, that's certainly, you know, uh, a portion of it. Um, we have folks with very serious mental illness, and okay. you know we have we have folks that that need um, more more private and serious, more robust services. Uh, we we offer wound care, we offer medication management, um, we can do physical exams. But folks out there, they they need real support. They need money. They need housing. They need specialist care that only major hospital systems can provide. A street medicine group just can't provide adequate uh, services for these folks. You know, we do our small part, but really we need systemic change uh, to meet these folks' needs in any appreciable capacity. Sure, and I think I've read somewhere, and I'm not 100% sure of the accuracy of this, but I think the general sentiment is true that for every x amount of dollars that are invested on the front end it saves a multiplier of something like five or ten on the back end if you invest in institutions to help people earlier on that are not able to afford it it comes back in an in incredible amount of savings um and i always wonder you know it's it seems like in many things uh, we can take these short-sighted approaches to what could needs to be you know, a long-term solution. And sometimes in the interim between getting to a long-term fix, the investment seems too enormous. But when, I mean, the amount we spend on healthcare on this, in this country is absolutely exorbitant and those numbers continue and continue to inflate. Well, people that can barely afford to get by as it is, you know, one medical issue I imagine can throw their whole life off, off its axis. What what institutional changes do you think could make a big difference in in the near future? Maybe not you know in the next week, but in the next year, coming years. What do you think are some things that could change now? Um, some specific policies that you know we would like to see changed. Mm. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. There, there's a lot. We we um, we have kind of a a lot of smaller policies like within 
our clinics, within our hospitals that we're trying to change. Um, and I, I won't really talk about those ad hoc because those are kind of ongoing discussions now. Um, but we, we also advocate for broader change as well at the state level, uh, at the local level, at the state level, at the national level. Um, there have been some efforts in California recently where Brett Feldman, who's one of the leaders in the street medicine movement, um, worked to get the street medicine bill passed. And this would essentially get this work reimbursed by Medicare. Uh, you know, these are sort of things where the field of street medicine would benefit a lot. You would have a lot more service providers willing to do this work if it were reimbursed. Mm -hmm. um, you also need to like improve more community projects. Uh, you need respite care, you need disaster relief programs, uh, you need rapid rehousing programs, you need alternatives to 911 for mental health crises. Uh, and, and we're actually working on a number of these programs. We need sobering centers, trauma recovery bays, and the like, uh, reforms in education, and, and we're working on all of these projects actually uh, here in Miami to try and improve community access to care and the community's sort of response to itself. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about, you know, the institutional needs, but what about your organization itself? What are some of the demands that it takes running an organization like this? And uh, what have you learned from it? It's, this is like incredible. <laughs> it is w worthy of a, a lifetime of learning. Um, this is a, a huge journey and I'm, I'm really just very new to this. Hmm. Uh, nonprofit administration, management, the rest. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a student and a learner. And I think this has been really unique because it's been so successful so quickly, hmm. but also just appreciating that uh, there are folks who have been, been at this for a long time. And I have, I have so much to learn in terms of how to really dig in and improve the quality of our services and ensure uh, nothing but ethical and consistent operations. Uh, that's, that's how we stand to make an impact. And, and that's always where my head's at is like, how can we make small and careful improvements to what we do uh, to better serve our patients. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are the most important qualities of a leader? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, it's, it's tough because, you know, you have to sort of lead different people differently. Um, mm. You have some folks who will respond to, um, kindness and mutual respect. You have other people who sort of need more direction, more guidance. Um, so I think I've found that it's best to be authentic mm -hmm. and maintain that as a pillar of your leadership uh, to lead by example and show people like the possibilities um, with a vision as well. And then also just not expect anything of someone else that you wouldn't do and not be too good for anything. Um, you know, there's a, a good leader kind of takes out the trash and, and cleans up the, you know, the best surgeons I ever saw are the ones who, who stay and clean up after the operation is mm -hmm. over. Um, you know, they're not, they're not too good for it. And so they really lead in that capacity and, sort of adjust the communication aspect and, and the management aspect based on the individuals they're working with. Sure, sure. And I think uh, for you, it, does that look like going out on the street runs and you know being with the team at all stages? Yeah, that's, that's really important because of course I wrote all the, the theory as to how this should work. I wrote the policies as to how this should work. I wrote the workflows for who does what and how we report and the EMR and all, all these things, but what about actually doing it? And so, right. yes, it's a super important part to actually do it and show people, Hey, this is, this is 
it's possible, it's impactful, and, and this is how we do it. Um, it's also very important to kind of demonstrate the values as well and make sure that um, sort of the mission and, and the broader arc of the organization isn't lost. What do you think the future of Miami Street Medicine looks like in the next you know, year, two years, as you go through the end of your medical education? Yeah, um, I would I would like for, I think, another student to step up and kind of assume the role that I'm in and I'll stay by for anticipatory guidance and the rest. Um, I'll probably move to do like case management with our, our patients and just kind of stay on the, the side um, because this was never supposed to be something that is about me or, you know, you know, it, it's not my operation. I, I really want it to be of and, and by the community. And so I want to pass this on uh, to the next generation of people who, who aim to serve this population. Mm. Um, the next few years will be uh, a lot of schooling for you as well, right? You have a couple big exams coming up. That's right. I got I to gotta pass my board exams and my shelf exams and prep for residency applications and interviews and stuff. So that'll that'll be a busy time and um, I'll be glad to have someone's help during that as well. So how has it been that you've been able to manage the time commitments between your exams coming up and running the organization and, you know, hopefully a couple minutes of free time a day, what has been your strategy and path to success? My girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's it. Like I could not, I could not be doing this without her. Um, she really does support the hell out of me and everything that I do and it just it wouldn't be possible without her oh that's awesome it's always good to have a partner to you know support your ambitions like this and you said something earlier that kind of resonated with me that's why I prompted that question you said you know that it is your passion I think sometimes finding time for our passions becomes something that's I don't want to say unavoidable but it's 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 less difficult than when you know, something might not be as, as much of interest, but when you, when I really care about something, I know that sometimes it's hard to pull myself away from it rather than the alternative. And, uh, yeah. I mean, based on, you know, the amount of time you put in and the thought you put into this, I'm sure that that's probably how you feel. And I'm sure the reward of seeing these people, you know, and the gratitude they have for you offering this service that didn't previously exist has meant quite a bit to you. Yeah, it's, it's really been, um, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm still kind of dealing with the internal conflict of it because it's, it's really heartwarming and it's wonderful to see this take off. And I love seeing kind of the staff really, they've been stepping into their roles and taking on more responsibility uh, and just seeing all this take off has, has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, though, I'm, I'm constantly angry that we have to exist. Uh, right. I, I carry this around with me a lot that I am, I am just frustrated that we have to exist in the first place because we shouldn't. So it's, it's kind of tough and I haven't quite resolved my own feelings about, about no, it. No, absolutely. It's, it's like you see someone in peril and you offer to assist them, but if you could avoid them being in peril altogether, it'd probably be a, better solution for everyone involved but right i think about that and i know uh i believe you told me in the past that there's a street medicine group in chicago too um but i think about the homelessness crisis here miami i know california and i wonder what it'll take for you know there to be significant change i wonder what the tipping point is because it seems like with the amount of people that are afflicted by this that you know we would start to talk about it more but it doesn't seem to be getting the coverage that it should but every time i drive home off get off the freeway by uh, canal street in chicago i see this tent city and you know i, I wonder <laughs> is how long can this last there's got to be some better solution than that yeah absolutely there's, there's got to be something better it are 
the your patients typically in tents is that where they're living um some have tents some don't other folks uh they may go to a shelter at night uh, but you know they're not there during the day but the shelters are pretty crowded is that right yeah there's not enough shelter space for everyone and you guys, uh, this is jogging my memory, but you guys uh, took an active role in trying to pass out tents during the pandemic, right? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, the issue with the pandemic, one of the issues, was that in the beginning, they're telling everyone to shelter in place. Well, okay, how do you do that if you have no shelter? So right. not only that, but all the public services and programs that our, our local unhoused population relied on all shut down. And so what you had was, you know, stay at home, shelter in place, also everything stopped and these folks were just out on their own. Uh, there were no bathrooms for them to use, no running water, um, medical care was over, it was just emergencies only, um, showers and, and shelters were, were struggling. Uh, people weren't doing outreach at that time. Mm -hmm. So we organized with our, our now parent organization uh, to fundraise for a shower site that operated throughout the pandemic, uh, providing showers, clothes, thousands of pounds of clothes and masks, um, toilets and, and hygiene kits to, uh, to, to the folks that would come by as well as doing street outreach uh, doing COVID testing and, and the rest. And this was all under the purview of, of Dr. Armin Henderson, uh, uh, faculty at University of Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of collaborated with them to help fundraise for this and, and get tents and um, allow people to kind of shelter in place or isolate if they had COVID. Right. Yeah, the pandemic has been, <laughs> I mean... I hadn't really thought about that before we've, we've had this conversation, but I can't even imagine, like, like you said, the basic needs, like facilities, like, you know, a place to shower, a place to go to the bathroom, those things, like, I think it can be too easy to take them for granted. But, you know, when you stop and reflect, it's, it's a luxury to have a place to lay your head at night in those amenities. So, you know, well, I'm really grateful for your work. I, you know, I think it's amazing what you're doing. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. Um, Thank you. I, I appreciate the kind words and, you know, it's, it's what we do. We're just, we're just happy to do our small part. And if folks want to know more about the, the Dade County street response, uh, shower site effort, there's actually a Netflix documentary about that that just came out called convergence. Uh, and it features Dr. Henderson, um, kind of organizing this effort. Absolutely. And we'll provide a link to that in the bio for this episode. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time. I had a wonderful time talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. All right. And thank you to all of our listeners. This has been another episode of Bridging Chicago podcast. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bridging Chicago as produced by the SATC Solutions Center. Nothing contained in this podcast shall constitute financial, investment, legal, and or professional advice. No professional relationship of any kind is created between you and the podcast host or guest. You are urged to speak with your financial, investment, or legal advisors before making any investment or legal decisions. Furthermore, the opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the opinions of SATC Solution Center, SATC Law, or any of its employees. This podcast is created by the hosts and guests' individual capacities. All opinions on this podcast are or have been rendered based on specific facts under certain conditions and are subject to certain assumptions and may not and should not be used or relied upon for any other purpose, including but not limited to or use in or in connection with any investment purposes or legal proceeding.